Christ. Welcome once again to Jesus or Muhammad. We talk about Jesus, we talk about Muhammad, and both are important topics. Jesus is the risen Lord. Everyone needs to know about him. Uh, but Muslims need to know the truth about Islam, and non-Muslims need to know about Islam, because there are Muslims in the world who are coming to convert you. And you might think you know Jesus, you uh, don't have anything to worry about. That might be true. But you might eventually have children, and if you do not raise them to know the truth, then when a Muslim preacher comes along and starts telling them all kinds of things about how wonderful Islam is, your children might not know any better. And so we need to be grounded in uh, the teachings of Christianity and also the teachings of Islam because it's this general atmosphere of ignorance about Islam that allows Muslims to come into an area and preach Islam. And so the, you know, many Christians think, well, we don't need to know anything about Islam. We need to know about Christianity. But it's that atmosphere where people don't know anything about Islam that allows a Muslim preacher to come in and say, hey, you believe in peace and tolerance? Islam teaches peace and tolerance. You believe um, that you should submit to God? Islam is the religion of submission to God. You believe in women's rights? Muhammad was a champion of women's rights. If people don't know what Islam actually teaches, Muslim preachers get away with this. They get away with saying these things and of misleading people. And so Christ, there comes a point where Christians have to take the initiative, have to learn some things about Islam so that we can then refute people who are making false claims about Islam and then help people uh, both to leave Islam and not to convert to it in the first place. So I would say Christians in general need to start learning some things about Islam. Now, obviously, you don't need to, you don't need to memorize the Quran or memorize all kinds of uh, passages or, or read all the entire, you know, read through the Hadith. Uh, but I would say that Christians in general need to know the basics, you need to start learning the basics of Islam so that they can at least hold a conversation. And so on this episode of Jesus or Muhammad, we're going to go through just the, 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 the basics. And what we're going to be looking at is what Islam teaches about God, what Islam teaches about Jesus, what Islam teaches about Christians, what Islam teaches about the Quran, and what Islam teaches about Muhammad. So just uh, five basic categories of what Islam teaches so that you'll have a general idea of what it is that Muslims believe and what it is the Quran says. So we'll just look at those five things and that'll be a good introduction to what Christians need to start learning about Islam. Then of course, um, it's good to learn how to refute Muslim arguments against Christianity and to respond to Muslim arguments that they use for, uh, to support the Quran or the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, but we're, we're going to just cover the basics here of uh, basic Muslim beliefs on, um, on God, Jesus, Christians, the Quran, and Muhammad. So what Islam teaches about God? And I'm just going to give you a quick idea, tell you what uh, the belief is, and I'll give you the reference in case you want to look it up. And you can go to QuranBrowser.org or QuranBrowser.com, and these will give you multiple Quran translations, so you can then look up the verses. And that's you know you could always go to a bookstore and grab a copy of the Quran as well. But I'm giving you the references so that then you can look these verses up on anything you want to actually read for yourself what Islam teaches. So we'll uh, I'll just give you the references and what the, what the basic idea of the verse is, and then if you want to actually go through the verses, you'll you'll be able to do that. So according to Islam, and each category. Uh, for the first couple points, I'm going to uh, share some things that Islam believes that many of us would agree with, and then some things that uh, work go in, the, in a different direction. So according to Islam, Allah is all-powerful. And that's something that Christians would believe about God. We believe that God is all-powerful. God can do anything that can, that can be done. Um, so Allah is all-powerful. That's chapter 2, verse 106. And there, there can be other references. I'm just giving an example of uh, certain verses. So Allah is all-powerful. Allah is all-knowing and wise. That's chapter 24, verse 21 of the Quran. Allah is just and merciful. It's chapter 11, verse 45, and chapter 24, uh, 24, verse 21. And Allah created the universe, chapter 41, verses 9 through 12. So these are things that, that, that Muslims would share uh, with Christians as what we believe about God. We believe in an all-powerful, all-knowing, just, merciful uh, creator of the universe. And so when someone says, do Christians and Muslims believe in the same God, I would say it kind of depends on what you mean. If you mean we both believe in a creator, we both believe in an, an all-powerful, all-knowing, merciful and just creator of the universe, in that sense, yes, we would believe the same thing about God. But that's not all we believe about God. And so we'd have to say um, no, based on some other things. What are those other things? Well, according to Islam, Allah is not a trinity. And you can read chapter 5, verse 116. 
uh, of the Quran on this, which uh, isn't even a correct description of the Trinity. According to the Quran, the Trinity is made up of Allah, Jesus, and Mary. And the reason for that seems to be Muhammad just didn't know what Christians actually believe. He heard Christians uh, talking about the Trinity, and he hears Christians talking about God and Jesus and Mary. And he assumes that the Trinity is God, Jesus, and Mary, because he hears Christians talking about God, Jesus, and Mary, and he's saying the Trinity. And so Muhammad apparently thought that we believe in a kind of holy family or something like that. Now, no Christian has ever taught that. Um, not even heretical, unorthodox Christians have ever taught that. So it's, it's, it's very odd that Allah would be refuting a doctrine that no one holds, that no one in history has ever um, adhered to, and that this would be a response to the Trinity. Um, but we're not actually going into problems with Islam right now. We're not, going with, uh, we're, not, we're not mainly interested here in pointing out the difficulties in Islam. Just want you to know that according to Islam, God is not a trinity. So, so Islam and Christianity would differ on that. According to Islam, Allah is a father to no one. So we, we, call, we, call, we refer to God our father. Um, according to Islam, Allah is a father to no one. You can look up chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 19, verses 83, I mean, verses 88 to 93, and chapter 21, verse 26. What you find in Islam, the only relationship you can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship. You are the slave, and Allah is the master, and that's how everyone must approach Allah. So there, there's, no, there's no concept of Allah as your heavenly father, as we would have in Christianity. And according to Islam, Allah does not love unbelievers. It's chapter 3, verse 32 of the Quran. If you reject Islam, Allah does not love you. And that's very different from what you would read, for instance, in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says that you have to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So we have to love everyone, even our enemies, uh, because we want to be like God, and therefore God must love everyone. Well, Allah isn't like that. And so we need to be aware of the differences in the concept of God um, between Islam and Christianity. And so now we have some similarities, all-powerful, all-knowing, things like that, and we have some very big differences. Not a trinity, God is not a father to anyone, and Allah doesn't love unbelievers. What Islam teaches about Jesus? And here it's interesting because Muslims agree with Christians on, uh, on several things that no one else agrees with us on, right? There's not a lot of people who, um, who agree that Jesus is born of a virgin or that Jesus prefer, uh, performed miracles. Atheists don't believe that, for instance. But Muslims agree with us on some. We, have, we share some interesting common ground with Muslims on uh, our view of Jesus. So according to Islam, Jesus was born of a virgin. You can go to chapter 3, verse 47 to read that. Jesus is born of a virgin in Islam. According to Islam, Jesus performed many miracles. That's chapter, thir uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 49. So Jesus lives a miraculous life. He's not just a, a, you know, a, a, just a, random, a random person here. He's actually uh, he's raising the dead. He's curing lepers. He's doing a lot of the things that we read about in the Bible. And Jesus was the Messiah, according to Islam. I don't think that Muhammad had any idea what that actually means, um, but Islam does acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. It's chapter 3, verse 45 of the Quran, if you want to read it. So, we share a lot of interesting common ground. Now, the problem is that that's not all that Islam says about Jesus. And we've pointed out before on these programs that it, Islam is almost exactly what you would expect from, a reading the, from reading the Bible. Islam is exactly what you would expect uh, when a false prophet comes. Why is that? Well, we're told lots of things about Jesus, but we're, we're told that the core of the Christian gospel, the message that the apostles went out and preached in the book of Acts, is a message about Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for sins. He rose from the dead, and he is Lord. Wherever the apostles went to preach Christianity, that's what they preached. That's the core message. So Jesus is teaching all kinds of things about how to live and what to do and how you should act. But the core of the gospel, the gospel, is a message about Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his divine nature. So that's the core of the gospel. We're also told that false prophets and false teachers are going to come to lead people astray. Well, if you're going to lead people astray, you need to corrupt that message of the gospel. If you're going to corrupt the message of the gospel, you want to be convincing and persuasive with it. And so you can agree with Christians on many other things as long as you're somehow corrupting the gospel. Then Muhammad comes along. You Christians, you believe in God? I do too. 
you believe God is all-powerful and all-knowing and just and uh, he's creator? I do too. I believe that. Uh, you believe Jesus was born of a virgin? Hey, me too. No one else agrees with you on that, but I do. You believe Jesus lived a miraculous life? I believe that too. You believe he's the Messiah? Me too. We agree on almost everything. But there are just three little things that we can't agree on, and we're going to have to fight over them if you uh, don't want get to get with the program. What are those three things? Well, according to Islam, Jesus was not divine. And here you can go to chapter 5, verse 116 to 117 again. Uh, you can also go to chapter 9, verse 30, that Jesus is not the Son of God. Jesus did not die on the cross. You can go to chapter 4, verse 157 to 158 to see what happened. Jesus didn't die. He wasn't crucified. Instead, Allah rescued him, took him to himself. And we know from other Muslim sources that what happened was Allah disguised someone to make him look like Jesus. And that this other person who was disguised uh, was crucified. And this other person was crucified. And, but everyone thought it was Jesus because Allah had disguised him. And so the reason you, as a Christian, believe that Jesus died on the cross is that Allah did an amazing job tricking everyone. It's a very uh, interesting bit of theology here. So Jesus is not divine. He didn't die on the cross. And, of course, he didn't rise from the dead. That, you get that from uh, four, chapter 4, verse 158. If Allah takes Jesus to uh, heaven without dying, Jesus uh, didn't rise from the dead. He didn't die. So that's what Muslims believe about Jesus. There's lots more we could cover, but we want to get to just the basics. What Islam teaches about Christians. According to the Quran, Christians have scripture from God. We have scripture that is from God. This is chapter 5, uh, verse 68 of the Quran. It's chapter 7, verse 157. It's chapter 5, verse 47. Over and over again, we are commanded to, uh, that we have to judge by the gospel, that we have to stand upon the gospel, that we have a book, that we have the gospel, and we read the gospel. Well, if, if Allah, if the Quran says that we have the gospel and that we need to judge by the gospel and that we need to stand upon the gospel, then obviously we, we have the gospel. We have the gospel. We have reliable scripture from God that we must judge by. The reason this is important, because lots of Muslims don't realize that that's what Islam teaches. In other words, you could be telling a Muslim what his religion teaches and that he doesn't actually believe. The reason that's important is many Muslims will tell you that the gospel has been corrupted. It's not what the Quran says. The Quran doesn't say the gospel has been corrupted. The Quran says that the gospel is inspired. That's chapter 3, verses 3 through 4 of the Quran. Uh, according to the Quran, no one can change Allah's words. You can read uh, chapter 18, verse 27, uh, for instance, on that. Muslims will say there, well, it's talking about the Quran. Well, it says no one can change Allah's words. And since th chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, declare that the Torah and the gospel are Allah's words, well, then put it together. No one can change the Torah and the gospel. And that's why Allah commands us to judge by the gospel. He says we, we have the gospel, we read the gospel, and we have to stand upon the gospel. So according to the Quran, and again, you're, you know, if you meet a Muslim, the Muslim won't believe this. The Muslim hasn't even read these passages. But according to the Quran, Christians have scripture from God that we must judge by. According to the Quran, chapter 5, verse 82, Christians are the nearest in friendship to Muslims. I wish that had been you know, the revelation that they had stuck with. Eventually, Muhammad taught his followers uh, to fight and subjugate Christians. Um, but at the time of chapter 5, verse 82, it said Christians are nearest in friendship to Muslims. So the, the general pattern that you find is, at first, Muhammad is preaching to pagans, but the pagans reject him. And then so he starts telling the pagans and the polytheists, ah, I'm with the Christians and Jews. We all believe in one God. We don't believe in lots of God, like gods like you, uh, like you pagans and polytheists. So it's, it's, I'm with the Christians and Jews. And then he travels to Medina, where there are three Jewish tribes. The Jewish tribes reject him. They make fun of him. And then it's Muhammad saying, ah, it's the, it's the pagans and the Jews who are bad. It's me and the Christians. And then, of course, so that's when this is, that's when this is written. And then, of course, the Christians reject him as well. And then it's Muslims versus everyone. Christians are compassionate and merciful, according to the Quran. Allah ordained in our hearts compassion and mercy, according to chapter 57, verse 27. So if, Christian, so if a Muslim tells you, ah, Christianity promotes violence and so on, uh, well, one, not according to the Bible, and two, not according to the Quran. According to the Quran, Allah uh, gave us compassion and mercy. So those are some things that, so there's some positive things that Islam teaches about Christians, um, but it's not all that Islam teaches about Christians. Look at, let's look at a few more things. 
Christians who believe in the deity of Christ, so if we say that Jesus is God, or we say Jesus is the Son of God, or Jesus is Lord, we are unbelievers. We are not real believers in God. So that's chapter 5, verse 17 of the Quran. We are not believers if we claim that Jesus is God, or the Son of God, or that Jesus is Lord. Christians who are unbelievers are the worst of creatures. Chapter 98, verse 6 of the Quran. It's talking about Jews, Christians, and al-Mushrikun. These are the uh, idolaters. But it says that we are the worst of creatures. We're lower than dogs. We're lower than pigs, according to the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 51. Muslims must not be friends with Christians. Muslims aren't allowed to be friends with Christians. That doesn't mean you don't have Muslim friends. Your Muslim friend probably hasn't read that before, hasn't read chapter 5, verse 51 of the Quran, which commands Muslims not to be friends with Jews and Christians. And even if your Muslim friend did read it, he would just reinterpret it. He would say, well, it says don't be friends with uh, Jews and Christians, but uh, I'm going to be friends with Jews and Christians anyway, because that can't be what it means. Uh, but we're not talking about what your average Muslim would believe. We're talking about what Islam teaches and what you need to know about Islam. And so chapter 5, verse 51, Muslims aren't allowed to be friends with Christians. Chapter 9, verse 29, Christians are to be fought and subjugated because of our unbelief. So Christians who believe in the deity of Christ are unbelievers. Unbelievers are the worst of creatures. Muslims aren't allowed to be friends with them. And Muslims have to violently subjugate Christians until we pay the jizya, until we pay tribute money acknowledging our inferiority. So notice in, in these first three categories, uh, beliefs about God, um, beliefs about Jesus, beliefs about Christians, what Islam teaches on e each of these things, there are lots of things that we would like, and there are other things that we would regard as pretty rough, especially you know, commands to fight and subjugate us. So those are what Islam believes on several Christian topics. But we also need to know a little bit about what Islam teaches uh, about Islamic topics, what Islam teaches about the Quran, what Islam teaches about Muhammad. And so let's look at those. According to the Quran, the Quran itself is unsurpassable in its literary excellence. And you could read chapter 2, verse 23. There are many other passages on this. But uh, the, the main one I would go to is chapter 2, verse 23 of the Quran. That's where Allah issues the challenge that if you don't want to believe in the Quran, if you think the Quran is from someone other than Allah, produce a chapter like it. Bring a chapter like something in the Quran. And if you can't do it, if you can't bring something like what we read in the Quran, then you have to admit it's from God. That's a very weird argument. We talked about that before. We'll talk about it again when we, when we go through uh, how to respond to basic Muslim arguments for Islam, Muslim, arguments Muslims use to show that Muhammad is a prophet or that the Quran is the word of God. But here, we just want to focus on the idea that according to Islam, according to the Quran, the Quran is just unsurpassable. It's so wonderful that it could only come from God. Chapter 4, verse 82 of the Quran declares, that the Quran is free from error and corruption. There's no discrepancy in it. And you know, this is important because you, know, you, can, you, you can actually find all kinds of problems with the Quran, historical problems, scientific problems, if Muslims are telling you that the Quran is a scientific masterpiece, um, contradictions. You can find all kinds of things in the Quran. Um, but the Quran itself maintains that uh, it's free from error and contradiction. In chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran, claims that Allah protects the Quran from corruption. Uh, Muslims, anywhere you go, will tell you that the Quran has been perfectly preserved down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. There's been no change, not in a single letter, since the time it was revealed down to the present day. Now, what's interesting is that is a, the only basis for that is, is theological. If you go to the Muslim sources, you find all kinds of changes to the Quran, tons of changes to the Quran entire chapters, and this, this is all according to Muslim sources, it's not according to me, it's not according to Christian sources, it's not according to Jewish sources, it's not according to uh, Western scholars, this is according to Muslim sources, the Hadith and other works. According to Muslim sources, entire chapters of the Quran were lost. They were just forgotten. Muslims didn't recite them enough and they were forgotten. According to Muslim sources, large passages, large sections of chapters were lost. According to Muslim sources, individual verses were lost. According to Sunan ibn Majah, Aisha uh, reports that she had the only copy of the verse on stoning an adulteress and the verse on breastfeeding an adult. She had the only copy, and her sheep came in and ate it. 
She had the only copy. And so these verses, you can open the Quran, read it from beginning to end. These verses are not in there today. Why aren't they in there? Because Aisha had the only copy and her sheep ate it. That's what you find when you actually read the Muslim sources. It's silly, absolutely silly and ridiculous to claim that the Quran has been perfectly preserved down to the letter if you read the Muslim sources. Well then, why do Muslims believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved down to the letter? It's because of what the Quran says, not because of, uh, not because of actually doing a, a, a historical investigation of the preservation of the Quran or from examining textual manuscripts. It has nothing to do with that. It's just the Quran says it, and so that's what it's true. Well, what if all of history shows that that's wrong? Well, so much for all of history. Who cares about history when the Quran says that Allah will guard the Quran from corruption? And so you get an idea of how, uh, uh, of how much Muslims trust the Quran and how little evidence and reasoning really matter. I can quote your own sources to you showing the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved. Well, who cares about those sources then? Who cares about the sources? Why do you believe the Quran's been perfectly preserved? Because Allah says he, he, would, he would protect it from corruption. Now, if you put that together, th and it, here's the reason you want to know what Islam teaches, and then you know, when we respond to Muslim arguments, we will uh, we'll want to show why the Islamic belief is wrong. But what you want to do is put it together for the Muslim. Look, if Allah says he's going to protect the Quran from corruption, and entire chapters and passages and verses are lost, What's that mean? It means that Allah is wrong, that he wasn't protecting it. Well, that means that the Quran is wrong when it claims that Allah would perfectly preserve it. So Islam is wrong. It's false. You're, there's something wrong with your book. And your book claims that there's no discrepancy in it. Uh, and yet Allah says he's going to protect it, and he didn't. And so there is discrepancy. You can put all this together for the Muslim because their leaders aren't putting it together for them. Their family isn't putting it together for them. The media, politicians, school, none of that's putting this together for them. So if they're going to get accurate information about Islam, many times it's going to have to come from people like us. So if you have a Muslim friend, you, you are in that position for a very good reason to share this information with that person so that this person will start to learn the truth. Because again, he's not, getting, he's not gonna get it from anywhere else. He's not gonna get it from anywhere else. So that comes down to us. So we have that privilege. We have the privilege of sharing the gospel. We have the privilege of refuting false claims about Islam. And finally, what Islam teaches about Muhammad. Now, there are lots of things that Islam teaches about Muhammad. Uh, Muslims have massive collections of stories about Muhammad. They're called, they're called the Hadith. So just to give you a general idea, Muslims have the Quran. You hear, you hear about the Quran. If, if we're talking about just complete basics, I'm not assuming that, that, uh, that you've ever heard anything about Islam before. But uh, Muslims believe in a book called the Quran. That's not the word of Muhammad. According to Islam, that is the word of Allah. It's revealed to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. So Gabriel gets it. He reveals it to Muhammad. Muhammad shares it with his followers. His followers uh, write parts of it down, memorize parts of it. Eventually, it's put together into a book. And the reason it was put together into a book was Muslims started losing some of it. And so they realized that memory isn't a very good idea. Uh, so just remembering it, it's not good enough. We need it in a book so that we don't lose more of it. But that's why the Quran was put together into a book. But the Quran itself is not supposedly the teachings of Muhammad. It's not supposedly about Muhammad. It's the direct word of Allah, and it's eternal. It's Allah's eternal word. But Muslims don't just believe in the Quran, because the, the Quran uh, tells Muslims that they have to follow the example of Muhammad and obey Muhammad's decisions. Well, the Quran doesn't contain Muhammad's example and Muhammad's decisions. That comes from somewhere else. You find Muhammad's example, stories about Muhammad and how he lived, uh, and Muhammad's teachings, what he told his followers to do, those are in different works called uh, the Hadith. And you have um, six major collections, according to Sunni Islam. You have six major collections, but these are very large collections. Um, they're, they're, Sahih al-Bukhari is considered uh, the most reliable, along with Sahih Muslim. But these are, I mean, Sahih al-Bukhari is nine volumes. Sahih al-Bukhari is nine volumes. So that's just one of the, ma of the six major collections. And the six major collections aren't the only collections. Those are just, the, the, those are just the, the considered the, the best. So it's a lot of reading, and that's part of why we're getting down to basics, because that can be a lot of material to go through, and it can be kind of intimidating for starting on studying Islam. But so anyway, the point here is, if you want to learn about Muhammad, there's a lot of reading to do. But we just want to cover briefly what the Quran claims in general about Muhammad. And of course, Muhammad, according to chapter 33, verse 21 of the Quran, is the greatest moral example for Muslims. He's the pattern. He's the example. He's the exemplar. So he is the pattern of conduct that Muslims are supposed to strive to imitate. 
So that's sort of the role of Muhammad, and that's why you need the Hadith, because that's where you find out how Muhammad lived and what he taught. You go there, you get a picture of how Muhammad lived, and then you try to imitate that, and that's what the Quran is saying. Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, chapter 33, verse 40. So the, the picture that you get from Islam, well, lots of, lots of passages of the Quran, it, it, it almost sounds like, the impression that you would get is that God sent prophets all over the world, but there hadn't been a prophet to the Arabs yet, and so, uh, so Allah sent a prophet to the Arabs, and that is Muhammad. So the only real purpose of Muhammad is just that since there were prophets sent everywhere else, now there needed to be a prophet to the Arabs, and that's Muhammad. But, you know, as time sort of went on, uh, Muhammad became more and more central until it was Muhammad is the last, final messenger who's sent with the revelation, and this is the revelation for all people. So Muhammad's importance seemed to increase in his own mind as time went on. And so uh, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, chapter 33, verse 40, and this is why Muslims believe there can't be another prophet or messenger after Muhammad, and this is why Muslims would... Uh, persecute groups like the Ahmadis who consider themselves Muslims but believe in a kind of reformer, the second coming of Jesus, um, named Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. So they believe in someone that came along after Muhammad and, and in, in places like Pakistan or Indonesia, Ahmadis will get killed by Muslims uh, because they believe in, because they're, they're contradicting the idea that Muhammad is the, the seal of the prophets according to, to Muslims. And according to the Quran, earlier prophets spoke about Muhammad. They predicted that Muhammad was coming. So chapter 7, verse 157 says that we find Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the Gospel. And chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran actually tells us a little bit about what we read uh, about Muhammad. And so those are just some basic teachings about Islam that you don't, you don't, you don't have to know them, but if we want to start getting past the ignorance uh, here we, that, that we have here in the West on the topic of Islam, if we want to get to a point where the media has to stop lying to us because we're well informed, we're going to have to start learning the basics about Islam. There's certainly much more to cover, but here we've gone through what Islam teaches about God, what Islam teaches about Jesus, what Islam teaches about Christians, what Islam teaches about the Quran, what Islam teaches about Muhammad. If you get these basic ideas down, get this material down, that'll be a good foundation that you can build on later in learning how to respond to Muslim arguments against Christianity, learning how to respond to arguments that Muslims give for Islam. It's a good foundation. I hope you'll work your way through this material, learn it, and we can build on that in future episodes of Jesus or Muhammad. See you then.